How many of you had a, um, like a comfort blanket, a security blanket as a kid? Okay, anyone have something? I mean, you could have one now. I, as I was walking up, I was thinking like, my scriptures are all on here, but I keep my Bible. Like even if I'm not using it, I keep it, so it's like my security blanket. So just blankets, or do you guys have other things as security items? Hippo. I, the beanie. A real hippo? The beanie. A beanie, okay, that's better. I was thinking like snuggling at night with a hippo would be awesome. But what else? Anything else as like a security thing? A lamp? Lamb like making noise like baby sheep? Oh, okay. That's better than a lamp. What? Lamb is softer than a hippo. I'd be more worried about rolling over on a lamb than rolling over on a hippo. Um, so why do, we, why do we have those security things? Why do we, why do we need those when we're... Mostly when we're little, sometimes when we're adults. Hmm? Life is scary without it. Life is scary. Life's scary. How many of you still have that security thing that you brought to college with you? All right. Don't be scared. It's okay. This is a safe zone. Safe zone. Um, so our passage tonight comes from Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> and so I'm going to read that passage, and it should be up on the board or screen. So... What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring only charge, any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised. Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What then shall we say to these things? This is really an appropriate place for us to end this semester. We've been talking about this, uh, about Paul's letters here for a few months now, and we're about halfway through. We're going to sit here for the break, halfway through this letter, and so now we look back. What do you say about these things you've heard? Um, what do you do with that? What do you do with what we've learned? Have we gained any knowledge of the scriptures this semester? Is that enough to gain knowledge of the scriptures? Has God's word been a catalyst for you to have action come into your life? Are we encouraged to go? Are we encouraged to do? We've been studying through this letter, so what then shall we say to these things? Our passage says that God did not spare his own son, so I thought it would be fun to bring a prop with me. You can sit or stand, whatever you want to do. You'll have some light. So this is Crawford. I've talked about him a few times. Um, Most of my illustrations come from him. Um, And so he's full of of fun stories. And and, um, we had a conversation earlier, and he is mostly going to behave tonight. So um, those of you who are the prayer warriors in the audience here, in the group, in the congregation here, let's um, pray that he does actually sit there and not decide that he's done. Uh, if any of you were at Lauren and Jonathan's wedding, Lauren, Jonathan Roth, Lauren Roth, um, we did photos afterward, and he was a ring bearer, and he decided um, part of the way through the photos, but not before he, was, like, before he was supposed to be done, that he was finished, and so he was done. So, so that's Crawford. But um, he's a fun guy to have around. Um, I love you guys, and I consider you all family. Amy and I joke about all of our children. Uh, as we saw earlier, some of you have better beards than others. And also, side note, everyone with a beard is actually a winner. So just want to throw that out for those of you who feel bad. <laughs> um, uh, but but I, consider you guys, I consider you guys family. Like, if you have a problem that I can help you with, I would help you. But I'm not going to give him up for you. I'm not even sorry. Royce is leaving now. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Glad it wasn't something super serious when I opened my mouth like that. But, 
like I would go to some lengths to help you guys. Like I would give you a ride, I would help you out with something, I would do your trig for you. <laughs> but if it's something that I have to give up, I would give up time with Crawford, in most cases probably joyfully. But I'm not gonna give up Crawford. I have to be careful what I say because Amy's here now, so. <laughs> So if you guys get a text from me, call me now. Just call me and I'll pretend that you have an emergency that I have to leave for and you know that someone is misbehaving. But I, I'm not gonna give up Crawford for you, no matter how close we are, no matter how much fun we have hanging out, no matter how good our conversations are. I love you guys, but not that much. I love him much more. Aww. Hopefully he'll remember this when he gets older. <laughs> so Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So Christ is God's son. He's God in the flesh, and he died, defeated death, rose again, and is interceding for us. He's going to God on our behalf because we can't make it on our own. It's because of Christ that we have a chance at that, and that's vital to our understanding of this passage and to really get what Paul's saying to the Church of Rome and to us. It's easy to pass over this and not feel the depth of what happened. Especially this time of year, we talk about Christ's birth. You know, Easter, we talk about his death, and we talk about these things, but how often do we actually let that sink in what happened there? You know, we, we say, God sent his one and only Son, and he died for us. No big deal. It's easy to say and not understand that God gave his Son. So this is what we're talking about here. God gave his son to death for you. Jesus completed and fulfilled prophecies. He fulfilled the law. He lived and died for you. What then shall we say to these things? This is what we've been doing all semester. We're going to continue next semester. We'll continue on until Jesus comes back. And then we'll stop. Happily. This Jesus, the one who died, he is God. He's a man. He's God in the flesh. Mark chapter 2 tells a story, and, and picking up in verse 9, it says, Which is easier, and this is Jesus talking, Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that they all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. So this is the story. Can you hold that for me? Thanks. This is the story of these guys. Jesus is talking. The house fills up. These guys have this friend. They carry him on a mat. They can't get through the door. There's so many people around, crowded, trying to hear what Jesus is saying, because when the Son of God is speaking in your town, it's worth making the effort to get there. So they want to get their friend there, so they go up on the roof, and they cut a hole in. And if you imagine someone cutting a hole through the roof, it's not like suddenly, boop, there he comes. There's like stuff falling. This is, people are wondering what's going on. They brought their friend and lowered him down. And Jesus says, he sees his friends, he sees their faith, and he says, son, your sins are forgiven. That wasn't enough. Some people started questioning it. So he asks them this question. He looks around, and he's like, which is easier, for me to tell him his sins are forgiven or for me to tell him to get up and walk? Which is easier, to heal a man or to forgive his sins? I mean, I can't do either, but I'd imagine it's easier to heal a man and help him walk than it is to forgive his sins because I'm not God. Jesus, on the other hand, is. And so he says, for the benefit of them all, he says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, so you know that I can forgive his sins. And he looked at the paralytic and he said, take your mat, get up, and go. And what did the guy do? Crowd participation. He picked up, like, got up, picked up his mat, and he walked out. That's the Jesus. He casts out demons. He healed. He brought dead people back to life, not people who were asleep, not people who were faking it. He brought dead people back to life, including himself. He turned water into wine. He took a sack lunch and fed thousands with it twice. He walked on water. He made the deaf able to hear, the blind to see. He served his followers, a man who could do these things. You remember the story? He washed their feet, another thing I'm not doing for you. He prayed for them. I will do that. 
and he prayed for us. He was beaten, he was mocked, he was killed, he got up again, he was seen, he was touched, and before he ascended to heaven, they watched him with a promise of his return. They asked him who he was. In Mark 14, the high priest asked him, saying, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. It's black and white. Jesus is the Word. And in John 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. My friends, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Think about that. God didn't even spare his own son because he loves you. My small group this semester, we meet and we, we review last week's sermon. We talk about it. Usually for most of the time, we actually stay on topic. Uh, thanks to Corey and his notes, we do a really good job because Corey is meticulous and it scares me. <laughs> but this week, we, we didn't have a sermon last week because it was Thanksgiving, so most people were doing family stuff. I went to bed at like 6 o'clock and it was great. Uh, but this week, we, we went over and since we didn't have a sermon from the week before, um, I thought it'd be good since I wasn't done with this yet to talk about this week's sermon, so maybe they'll give me some ideas. You guys are smart people. And so we talked about this passage, and it amazed me that as we talked and just kind of went through and I told the points that I had and the thoughts that I had, as I looked around, and it's typical for, for the engineers not to make a lot of eye contact, but I noticed that everyone was actually eyes in their Bibles. And, and so as we talked, most people in the group were just reading this passage. It's a short passage, and they're reading it over and reading it over and reading it over. And, and one of the people in the group said that it just it sinks in deeper. Every time you read it, you look at this and you read and you see, God didn't even spare his own son. What, what does that mean for me? And as you look through this passage, let it sink in. Let it sink in what God actually did. Because we blow by that a lot of times. I think we don't actually let it sink in what happened. I, I read a story recently of a, a college guy, and I thought you guys could relate. Uh, even the girls could relate to a college guy a little bit. Um, and he says this, he said, I thought I knew what was coming. Having meticulously studied this mountain in my GSU Geography 201 lab, I knew what to expect and was prepared to impress my traveling companion with my intricate knowledge of its shape, scope, and features. He had no idea he was traveling with an expert on Mount Rainier. We started following a narrow trail through the trees, and soon the path opened to a field of blooming wildflowers skirted with a thin layer of snow. We stopped on a ridge above a precipitous drop, with only the split rail fence separating us from a stunning view of the snow-draped volcanic cone that is the top of Mount Rainier. Grateful for a rare, clear day, I thought I knew what was coming, but what I saw was far more majestic than I could have dreamed, especially given that my study was based on squiggly line topographical maps, not high-definition reality. In a time before the personal computer, I really didn't have a clue what Rainier even looked like. Looking up, I was stunned. That's a picture of it, by the way. I had to make sure, because I've never been there. <laughs> have you ever been there? Not, not to Mount Rainier, but have you ever become an expert about something or someone on a paper, yet never seen it in real life? I wasn't prepared for what happened next. As the grandeur of the mountain started to sink in, I couldn't contain the beauty. Within a moment, tears were streaming down my face, and though I tried to avert it, I started to sob. Understand, this did not create the most comfortable moment for two young guys standing in a flowery meadow on a mountainside, <laughs> especially given that my friend had no clue why I was so emotional. I never gave my Rainier expert speech that day. The lesson from Mount Rainier became clear to me. There's a huge difference between knowing a lot about something and truly knowing something. That was Louis Giglio, by the way. Uh, he founded the Passion Movement. We can and we should strive to be an expert in the Bible and in especially what it says about Jesus, who Jesus claimed to be. However, just like this kid, just like Louis, we need to know Jesus through a daily pursuit of him. He is waiting to be known by all who seek his face. Anyone in here in a relationship? 
like a romantic, Twitter-pated, goofy relationship? Raise your hand, acknowledge, okay? If your significant other is here, you better raise your hand. Look around. All right, I am. All right, so those of you who are in a relationship, do you ever just like stare at the person's face? I don't know why you're laughing. I'll talk to Tiffany because she's being reasonable. No, like, I, it creeps Amy out sometimes, but I will stare at her face. I find her very attractive. Jack, you're out of words for the day. But I, I, want to, I want to know her. I want to like just soak it in. I want to look at her. I want just to memorize all her curves and all her edges. Is that how the song goes? I'm going to stop there. So back to the passage. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Just like I adore looking at Amy, and I saved this when she was here for the brownie points, but I, I like looking at her. We should feel that way about God. We should cherish those moments when we can look at our life and we can see God in our lives. God said, who will separate us from the love of Christ? He could have said, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. But he asks a question that makes us think, who will? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Paul gives us this list, and I want you to understand that this is not a hypothetical list of things that Paul thinks, that God told Paul. These are some things that may happen to some believers down the road. These are things that came from Paul's personal experience. Tribulation or, or affliction, maybe, in some of your Bibles, and distress. Those are outward and inward. Tribulation is that, that outward persistent pain, that great suffering that you can go through, and that distress is inward when you feel just inadequate, when you feel like you're not enough. You feel like you're always in a state of danger or you're in desperate need of something. Persecution, you guys have heard of persecution. Some of you may have faced some persecution, but it's that, that harassment uh, that, that we might receive because of our faith. Famine, a shortage typically of food, but a famine could be a shortage of anything, really. Nakedness, no clothes, no concealment, bare, defenseless. Danger, you guys know what danger feels like. And the sword is talking about death. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. These things that Paul says, nothing can separate us. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, and sword. These are his personal experiences. He's speaking as one who knows what might come to us, what will come to us if we pursue God. Paul knew what he was talking about. He experienced all of this except death, but knew that was coming. These things happen to Christians, to followers of Christ today. 
in our world. Jenna talked about the trip, human trafficking. That's going on now and, and not always in such a far distant away place. God's children are persecuted. Our brothers and sisters, God's children are in danger. God's children are killed for their faith because they proclaim Jesus as their Savior. What then shall we say to these things? How can we help? What action can we take? For sure we should pray, but if your prayers are just words, they're meaningless. Your prayers should be a catalyst to push you to action. Set aside your fear and step out, because the passage goes on and says that we are more than conquerors. Shandy talked about what that means a few weeks back, but we win. We, we not only win, we win overwhelmingly. More than that, Paul writes this in his response to that list we talked about in verse 35. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? None of those. He goes on in verse 38, for I am sure that neither life, death, nor life Angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have security. We have that blanket. We have that hippo. We have that lamb. We have that Bible under our arm. We have that thing that makes us feel safe. We have security in Christ. Nothing can separate us from him. And with that, when we carry that as our security blanket, we are more than conquerors. From the love of God, nothing can separate us. Death, life, those are things we all know about. We're living life now. We're going to die. We know people who have died. Angels, principalities, these are good, bad, real or not. They can't separate us from God. Things that have happened to us now or are happening to us, things that might happen in the future, they cannot separate you from the love of God. Height and depth, if time cannot separate us from God, neither can space. Nothing, period. No hardship, nothing that's happening, no situation, no, no beating you receive, no verbal lashing you get, no hurt someone does to you, no sin you commit can separate you from the Son of God. And you could repeat that statement, insert the blank, with whatever you think is putting you away from God, whatever you think is making God not love you anymore, you're wrong. There are wrong answers. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, and that is our security. I hate responsive readings, but as we close tonight, I'm going to ask you all to stand with me, and we're going to read this passage together. Once we get to the end, I'm going to say a prayer. The team is going to come up. We're going to sing another song. And if you want to pray with someone, come on up. Pray with me, Nathaniel, Shandy. We have interns. We have people all around you in this room who are more than happy to pray with you. If you have a question about something, ask. But know this. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Let's stand. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray.
God, I thank you so much for those promises. And I pray that we would allow that to sink in, God, that we would know that it's truth in our lives today, that we would know that no matter what has happened, no matter what might happen, God, that you love us and nothing can separate us from that love, God. I thank you for the sacrifice of your son. I thank you for the fact that you didn't even hold him back for us, God. And I pray that tonight that we would be overjoyed, that we would be filled with that love, God, that we would be called to action, we'd be ready to go out and share that love, God, and live a life that proclaims you as our Savior. God, I thank you so much for your love. I thank you for this group of believers here tonight, that we can come together, we can worship you, and we can know that on this campus that we represent you, God, and that we can go out boldly and proclaim your word, God. I thank you so much for your love, and it's in your son's name that I pray. Amen.